Welcome to this episode of the ASHA podcast. I'm Fred Wine, Director of Communications with the American Sexual Health Association, ASHA. Today, we're going to focus on the most recent surveillance report on sexually transmitted infections published by CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It came out in January this year, and it's really thought-provoking. Um, there were more than two and a half million cases of chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis reported in the U.S. in 2022 most recent year for which we have data. And this really just underlies why STI prevention is such a priority to those in, in public health. Um, certainly is big on our radar at all times. So there's a lot to get into and we're really fortunate because we're gonna be joined today by Dr. Laura Bachman. She's the acting director of the CDC's division of STD prevention. And she's a longtime friend of ASHA. So Dr. Bachman, thank you so much for taking time to chat with us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Good. So let's jump right in and we'll start with syphilis, if that's OK, because that was one of the headlines that really emerged out of the report. Syphilis cases are up 80 percent since 2018. What's driving this surge? Well, yeah, that's a great question. So as you pointed out, um, you know, we have more than 200,000 cases of syphilis in 2022 alone. These are numbers we have not seen since the 1950s. We had over 3,700 cases of congenital syphilis, and that's 10 times higher than in 2012. And we're seeing these increases across women, men, all ages, all regions of the country. And, you know, it's totally curable, but it can cause serious uh, damage to the heart and brain if left untreated. Now, our surveillance report does not tell us why STIs are increasing, but we do know several things do contribute. So some of these things um, are happening environmentally around us, such as um, social and economic conditions that make it more difficult for some people and groups to stay healthy. You know, things like poverty, stigma, lack of medical insurance or provider and unstable housing, or simply living somewhere where more people have STIs. Unfortunately, as you know, having an STI can, it still carries a lot of stigma and that can keep patients from asking for testing or talking about sexual health and it can keep providers from bringing it up too. Um, another thing that may be in play here, or we think is in play is, you know, for many years, there's been less and less STI screening, treatment, prevention and partner services at the state and local level. So, for the individual person, this could mean fewer opportunities to see a provider who can test, diagnose, and prescribe medication. Of course, you know, there's some individual uh, level factors we're seeing as well. Um, there's increases in substance use, and that has been linked to less safe sexual practices. For instance, the data um, show that a substantial amount of the syphilis infections in heterosexuals is occurring in people who use drugs, particularly methamphetamine. And some groups aren't using condoms as much, such as younger people and men who have sex with men. Okay. Th there's a lot to unpack there. And as we go along, if you don't mind, I'm going to come back to some of those points, especially around stigma and shame. I know that can really be uh, a huge barrier for a lot of people and some of the socioeconomic determinants uh, that, that, that you referenced. So um, uh, yeah, there, there's a lot we're going to cover. Uh, sticking with syphilis here, uh, just for one more question, you know, one of the most tragic aspects of this to me is just, is the increase in congenital syphilis. You touched on that. Syphilis passed from parent to baby during pregnancy. I mean, it's up 183% since 2018, I read in the report, it's all the most more frustrating because as you mentioned, it's largely preventable. So, but first, what can happen when babies get syphilis? Well, you know, congenital syphilis is extremely dangerous for babies. So without the right treatment, it can cause miscarriage, stillbirth, newborn death, and for, for the infants that survive severe lifelong health problems. But as you mentioned, it does not have to be this way. Uh, we can protect parents and babies with timely testing and treatment. Mm. So for someone who's pregnant or considering pregnancy, how can they take care of their health and, and the baby's health? Well, first we know that too many pregnant people are not being tested and treated or in, and not early enough during the pregnancy. Um, and we know, again, that, you know, congenital syphilis is preventable with the timely testing and treatment. So if you're pregnant or you're thinking about getting pregnant, remember, prenatal care is so important. 
talk to your provider about how to prevent syphilis. Um, everyone who is pregnant should be tested for syphilis on their first visit, and sometimes you'll need to be tested again. And ask your uh, provider about STI testing, and together you can figure out a plan that works for you and that keeps you and your baby safe and healthy. So looking at gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis combined, those are the three STIs that, that are included in the surveillance report. And I mentioned the top, there were more than two and a half million cases reported for these three STIs in 2022. So let me ask you, what, what can happen if these infections aren't detected and treated? I know you just talked about some of that with syphilis, but, just, but with the others, well, what kind of outcomes are we looking at? So, you know, an, un, an untreated STI can lead to serious and permanent health problems. So let's take gonorrhea and chlamydia, for instance. Um, for women, they can cause something called pelvic inflammatory disease. That's inflammation of the pelvic organs. And that can lead to ectopic pregnancy, which is also known as pregnancy outside of the womb, and um, even infertility um, or the inability to get pregnant. For men, both infections can cause a painful condition in the tubes attached to the testicles and severe cases may require treatment in the hospital for a few days. Um, in rare cases, this can cause infertility. Um, again, syphilis, it can seriously damage the heart and the brain if it goes untreated and also cause blindness and deafness. And as mentioned earlier, you know, it's incredibly dangerous if passed to newborns during pregnancy. And finally, just keep in mind, um, untreated chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis, they can all increase the chance of getting or transmitting HIV. Mm, that's a good point. So that lays it out pretty clearly. So what can people do to protect themselves and their partners from these infections? Well, there's a, a way to, to think about this that maybe be e easy for people to remember, and that is to talk, test, and treat. So let's take the first point. Talk openly and honestly to your partners and your healthcare provider about sexual health and sexually transmitted infections or STIs. Get tested. It's the only way to know for sure if you have an infection. Many STIs don't cause symptoms. So you have to be tested to really know um, what's going on. Um, if you're having sex, talk to your provider and ask what tests are right for you. And while you're there, ask them about HPV and hepatitis B vaccines. These are very effective vaccines. Mm -hmm. If you test positive, treat, you know, work with your healthcare provider to get the right treatment. Some STIs can be cured, but all STIs are treatable. And make sure you take all of your medication um, as prescribed, even if you start feeling better or your symptoms go away. Don't share your medicine with anyone and don't have sex again until you and your sexual partner have all completed treatment. Um, now, don't forget about condoms. We have lots of information on sure. how to use them the right way and even uh, a way to locate them, often for free or for a small fee. Um, and there's also some new options on the horizon. CDC is looking at how some people could use the common antibiotic doxycycline to help prevent syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia. And we're aiming to have um, official guidance out for providers this year. So hopefully that's something you can talk with your provider about soon as well. Okay. So you mentioned that, that, that testing is a big part of this. And uh, let's say somebody doesn't feel comfortable going to an STI clinic or even to their regular healthcare provider. Um, and this gets back to the shame and stigma angle. You know, what are some other options they might consider? So nowadays there are other STI care options uh, beyond the traditional in-person visit. So for instance, video or phone appointments with a healthcare provider, uh, express visits that allow walk-in STI testing and treatment appointments without a full clinical exam. Um, some of the pharmacies and retail clinics, such as a, at a grocery store or a big box store, um, are options for on-site testing and treatment. And uh, there's at-home collection um, available too, where you collect your own sample and take or mail it to a lab for testing. You can also use CDC's Get Tested website to find confidential testing that is free or low cost. Okay, um, and it just came to me that um, I want to talk with you about symptoms because it's 
you know, STIs, especially chlamydia and gonorrhea, right? They don't always have obvious symptoms or, or a clear sign. Um, and I, I, I think the messaging around that is that you just can't use the absence of symptoms uh, to say that you're okay. We still need to have these conversations with our providers and follow the device you're giving about, about uh, testing. Yes, that, that's absolutely true. Um, you know, females in particular don't have symptoms, but really it applies to everyone uh, because it also depends on where the infections are in terms of the likelihood of having any symptoms. So for instance, infections in the throat or the bottom um, usually are asymptomatic. Um, infections in the reproductive tract in, in women often symptom, um, asymptomatic. And so really you have to be tested uh, to, to know if you have an infection or not. Okay. I want to come back again to the idea of shame and stigma you've, you've, you've mentioned, and let's talk about that maybe a little more deeply. Um, just how does this affect accessing STI services? Is it just simply that people are just embarrassed because it involves something down there? I mean, just I, I'd just love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, I've been working in this field for my entire career, and I can tell you stigma and shame are very real. And those realities, they, they can play out in different ways. So it may keep someone from bringing up STIs to their provider or from, um, from going to their provider at all. Um, say if they have a concern, um, but they, they maybe will wait it out instead of going to, wanting to get it checked out. You know, the same thing applies to providers. Uh, stigma may make a provider too anxious to ask someone about their sexual history, um, to, you know, explore um, STI screening with them. Um, but, you know, stigma buries the truth that all people deserve quality sexual health care to live healthy lives. And, you know, we can stand up and make a difference by talking, uh, just like we are doing today. Sure. Yeah, definitely shine, shining a light on it and talking about it is, is so important. That's why we have talk along with test and treat. So um, I want to get back to the idea of health equity. And you, you touched on this, how some groups are disproportionately impacted and yeah teens and young adults right gay and bisexual men pregnant people communities of color are especially vulnerable with stis would you just expand on that a bit about about why these groups are are so disproportionately impacted and i guess more to the point how can we change this uh, of course i mean look, let's look at syphilis specifically it, it touches nearly every community but not everyone is affected equally so, for instance, um, some racial and ethnic groups remain harder hit due to longstanding social inequalities that often lead to health disparities, or in this case, a greater bur burden of syphilis. So I'll share some data points to help illustrate what I mean. Um, despite comprising 13% of the U.S. population, people who are Black, they represented nearly 32% of all primary and secondary syphilis cases and experienced around 30% of congenital syphilis cases in 2022. Primary, secondary, and congenital syphilis rates were highest among American Indian or Alaska Native. So out of every 155 pregnancies or births, I should say, amongst American Indian and Alaska Natives, there was one congenital syphilis case in 2022. So that's, that's really um, devastating. Now, these differences can show up in other ways, as you mentioned, um, such as by gender, by age, sexual orientation, and also geographic location. Um, keep in mind, health out outcomes are, there aren't just related to what happens in the exam room. They're, they're influenced by so many things. So the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, for instance. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but social and economic conditions can make it very challenging for some people and groups to stay healthy. So things like poverty, stigma, lack of insurance or provider, unstable housing, living somewhere where more people have STIs. And we know that health outcomes and not just STIs are, are affected by wider forces and systems that affect our daily lives, such as racism, climate, economic policies, social norms and policies, and political systems. 
These differences exist, but they shouldn't stand in the way of a person or a community's health. We all deserve good health, including sexual health. And I will say that health equity is a huge priority for CDC and something that we're more thoughtfully weaving into our work through research, funding, and partnerships. You know, in one of your earlier answers when you were you you touched on health equity, um, you mentioned that some that uh, one factor can be that that a person simply lives and loves in an area that has high rates of STI. So even if their behavior is exactly the same as somebody else, because they you know, their their networks and their community has high rates, that can put them at greater risk. Even if they're doing the same thing as somebody else, you know. So doesn't mean that a person's promiscuous or that they're that they're not doing something right it just may mean that their their environmental risk i guess in a way is just simply so much greater there's there's a lot to think about there yeah yeah absolutely i mean i mean if you just think about it it's it's just more likely the person's going to encounter um someone with an sti mm -hmm. when they live in a community where there's more stis even um, as you say, even if the, the risk in terms of behavior is, is no different from a, someone who lives in a low prevalence, an area where there's not a lot of STIs. Right. Yeah. All right. Dr. Laura Bachman, thank you for your time and your insights. We covered a lot today, I, I, I feel like. And I mean, this is, a, this is a big job, but I'm really glad you're on it. So thank, thank you again. Thanks for having me. And thank you, intrepid listener, for tuning into this conversation. In the show notes, just on the page where you access this episode, we will have links to data and resources, including the surveillance report we've been talking about, as well as CDC's brochure on syphilis prenatal screening, Protect Your Baby. We'll also have the clinic locators that Dr. Bachman mentioned so you can find free confidential testing in your area, a lot more tools. So please take a look. And let me get a plug in too, that STI Awareness Week is coming up. April 14th or 20th, and we'll have a lot for you then, as will CDC. So please check back with us often. Lots more to come. All right. Until next time, take care, everybody.